So turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we will read together from verse 7 to verse 18. Although we spent all of our time looking at verses 16 and 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 7 to verse 18. In the title of this message, We Don't Lose Heart. We Don't Lose Heart. It reads as following. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always been given over to death for Christ's sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believe when I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus Christ will raise us also with Christ and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary momentary affections is preparing us, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the, to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transcend, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The good Lord and a blessing to the reading of his weight. May he write his eternal truths upon our hearts. Brethren, Paul, as he writes to the church, and he writes this epistle, the second letter to the Corinthians, Paul was confident in the ministry of the gospel. You can hear he's confident in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's confident in the fact that whatever he was doing, he was doing for a good cause. And he was doing in accordance to the will of God. He says in chapter number 2, verse 17, We are not like so many peddlers of God's weight, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God. Paul knows who sent him to preach the gospel. Paul knows who sent him to encourage those who might be losing heart along the way. And then again, in chapter 4, verse 5, Paul says, what we preach is not ourselves. He does not stand before people and tell them stories about his journey and about all the things that he experienced in life. What we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. But as Paul was so confident in preaching the gospel, what we realized from this reading of this passage and the context of this chapter is the fact that Paul had opponents, people who opposed him personally and people who opposed the gospel that he preached. He had people who will listen to Paul and then preach in contrary to what Paul was preaching. And when people who could not do that, but they will just oppose Paul and be his opponent on a personal level and bring things that are personal to him, things that maybe are of weakness to him. Why? To slow him down. So some will afflict him and some will criticize him for those afflictions. In which way? They will say the afflictions indicate that Paul's message was faulty. Paul's message was defective. 
That is why we are so afflicted. That is why we are so suffering. Because the message that they are bringing is not from God. Or the life that we are living is not the life of God. So they are not just afflicting him, but they criticize him of the afflictions that others bring upon him. But Paul, writing to the church, he makes it clear that the weakness that he was suffering, the weakness that believers suffer, gives evidence that the message that people preach in, in the name of Jesus is not a message that comes from men. It is a message of God. We don't preach ourselves. The afflictions indicate that the message is not done for selfish gain. If you were preaching for selfish gain, whenever you get afflicted, you will live and go back home. If you were living for Christ, but for selfish gain in a way, whenever we are afflicted, you will just go back to your old life. That is what Paul is proving where we are in this letter. In church, on a general note, if there is anything I can recommend you as a church, as few as you are, is the fact that you have been holding on to the gospel of truth. You have been holding on to this gathering of believers, even though many may have seemed to drift away. You did not lose heart. In so many challenges and hurt that you might have been going through, that you, you, you went through, you did not lose heart. You just could not give up. And I know for a fact that there is nothing in me personally that has kept you going, that is keeping you standing in the Lord or in the life of faith. There is nothing in me that you see and say we will stand because of that man. But it is always and it has always been something that is in you that has kept you going. Something that is within you, that is not of you, that has kept you going and holding on to the gospel of truth. And it is the spirit of the living God that lives within you. If I have to recommend, that would be my recommendation. But even so, even though you have been holding on and standing firm in the truth, your, your, your faith has been strong. You as a person, you have faith that is strong or a, a spiritual life, but you also have a personal life. So even though that you have been standing strong and your faith, you have been holding on and, and you are firm in the things of God, I think verse 17 is true. Verse 17 tells you that there has been some trouble or afflictions which you have experienced or which you are going to experience on a personal level. Things that will actually almost cause you to lose heart simply because we are living in an evil world. Regardless of how strong your spirit may be or your faith may be, but on a personal level, there are things that may come to destroy, things that may come to cause you to lose heart. But praise be the Lord and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for the sake, for the fact that Jesus spoke to us of such things. And he says in John 16 verse 33, the last part of the verse, in the world, you know this verse, in the world you will have tribulations, you will have afflictions, you will have troubles, you have trials. You will face evil men and evil situations, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I think those are the words that we normally forget. These are the words that I personally forget. I remember that in the world we will have tribulation, we will have troubles, we have trials, but take heart, stand firm, do not lose heart. I have overcome the world. We forget that. And this is what Paul wants us to remember. What does this tell you? Sometimes, as I was saying, even if your faith is standing strong against every storm and every wind of the devil, there is always something personal that happens to hurt you. Why? Simply because Satan is never happy to see a happy child of God. It's the very same thing he did to Job. Just because Job was happy, then the devil had to, 
had to attack him on a personal level. Just because Job's faith was strong, he had to be attacked on a personal level. That is why there is two people in you. You who will die and you who will be raised from the dead. The one who was born in sin and the one who is reborn and be made one with God. And that's why that sometimes those two things, one can be strong, one can be weak. And when both are strong, Satan can only attack the personal because he cannot touch the eternal. And that is what we learn here. And the apostle says, we don't lose heart. So to understand all this and be encouraged from this passage this afternoon, I want us to look at three questions rising from this passage. Passage verses 16 and 17. Three questions. What does it mean we do not lose heart? Firstly. And secondly, what does it mean that our afflictions are light and momentarily? Thirdly, what is this eternal weight of glory that awaits us beyond comparison? And once we understand all these things, we will know that we should not lose heart. I want you to notice firstly, as we look, what does it mean we do not lose heart? Please notice in verse number 16, Paul is not saying, don't lose heart. That would have been a right thing to say. I can come to you and say, don't lose heart. Do not give up. But Paul is not saying such a thing. Although that would have been fine to say. But Paul is saying, we don't lose heart. Those two are two different things. Don't lose heart and we don't lose heart. Two different things. This one is a statement. It's an affirmation. This is who we are. This is our identity. This is our character. This is our pride, if you will. This is a testimony of our faith. We are the ones who do not lose heart. It would have been fine to say don't lose heart. But Paul is saying we don't lose heart regardless. We don't lose heart. Why? Because the Spirit of God dwells within us. Why? Because Christ himself did not lose heart on us. So Paul is saying we do not lose heart. He's not saying that we do not get afflicted. We do, but when we get afflicted, we do not lose heart. We must know ourselves as a people who do not lose heart. Once we know ourselves as a people who do not lose heart, we will not wait for someone to say, don't lose heart. The reason why we wait for people to say don't lose heart is because we forget that we are a people, our character, our identity, who we are, the person who do not lose heart. So, we are not to become discouraged. That's what this is saying. Do not, we are not the ones who become discouraged or anxious about things. We do not allow ourselves to become worried and fearful of situations. We are not those people. But we find ourselves there. Why? Because we, we forget that Christ has overcome the world. We are not the ones who should be anxious. He is saying here, though our physical bodies are growing older, and we notice that our outer man is progressively decaying and wasting away, nevertheless, our inner self is being renewed. What does that tell you? There are lots of things that happen physically and personal things that are happening to you that may cause you to lose heart, yet we do not lose heart. Regardless, he's making an example of the body that is getting old. Some people can be worried about that, but that's not where we are, that I'm getting old. If you get worried about getting old, he's saying the more you get older, the inner self is being renewed. You, you're beginning to know more and more about God. But now, in terms of afflictions, although things are happening on the outside, they affect the body, but they do not affect the eternal spirit that has been deposited on you. Friends, it is so easy to lose heart. Think about it. 
so easy to lose heart. To just think you will give up. It's easy to come to a place where we are ready to throw in a towel. You are ready to just lay down your burdens and you are ready to just quit. It's easy. You're looking at the situation that Paul was going through. Most of us would have quit. You preach. You've got this power of preaching and then when, when you preach and you walk, your, your, your shadow and your handkerchief raises people from the dead or uh, people get healed, but you come to a place where you preach and nothing happens, nobody is convinced. The only thing that they do, they stone you to death. It's easy to be discouraged or whatever you do, you just raise enemies. So it's easy to be discouraged. But Paul is saying here, let there be no one among us who will be found saying, I stumble from discouragement to discouragement. Therefore, I want to quit. It is time for me to quit. I've been doing so much good things, but I don't see any return from that. I feel I have given all that I can give, but there's nothing that I'm receiving. And I know sometimes we feel like that. But the Apostle is reminding us that we should not have such mindset because God is the one who is in charge. God oversees life and all circumstances. If we can just remember that God oversees our life in all circumstances. That is what the Apostle is saying to us. And church, I want to remind you, it is biblical to say like David in Psalm 55 verse 6. Let us open there. Some of you have never... Read those words. Psalm 55, verse 6. It's biblical to say these things. But when you say such things, don't say them because you are giving up. Only say because we are really ready to be in the presence of God. Verse 6. And I say, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, I will fly away and be at rest. Sounds like someone who's giving up. He just wants to live this life and be with God to be at rest. It's biblical. But we say these things when we really want to be in the presence of God. Just like the Apostle Paul. I'm trapped between the two to live with you or to be in the presence of God. This is not words that we say because we give up. But in most cases, we find ourselves at times wishing that we could just grow wings, a pair of wings, and fly away from troubles, fly away from trials, fly away from tribulations of this life. And I have been there many times in this couple of weeks. Just wish to fly away of space. Tribulation comes, trial comes. But Paul says, we don't lose heart. Of course, we must try to leave trials behind and afflictions behind. But when that does not happen, we do not lose heart. And the worst part of it that I really condemn myself for, and I think you must, always, you must also condemn yourself for if you come to that point. What kept me going was the thought of my family and children. My, children, my wife and children, my family. That's what kept me going. And that's wrong, church. The word of God should keep us going. Really, I, 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 after a little while and reading this particular passage, I realized that it's easy to just get lost and hold on to things that really can perish any time. What now makes me go to work or rise me early in the morning is my children and wife. Really? That's what strengthened me now. Mm -mm. We don't lose heart. We hold on to the things that are unseen than the things that are seen. Verse 18. Let us be encouraged by the word of God than the things that we have achieved in this life. That is the point. Okay, church. Every day, what we are told here, the outer man is being destroyed by pain. Day by day, the outer man is destroyed by pain by problems, by burdens, by trials, things that are thrown at this body can cause you to lose heart. 
One thing I keep forgetting and think so the same thing that everybody keeps forgetting is that this world we're living in is, a, is an evil world and we deal with fallen men. Paul and the church was dealing with fallen men. Even if your body could stay young, that's why he speak about the body. Even if your body could stay young, you will always have fallen people troubling you. Fallen men will always trouble you and you will lose heart. The fallen nature will always trouble you. The fallen nature causes men to get drunk and drive their nice little cars and hit someone on the road who is innocent. The fallen men, the fallen nature rather, causes fallen men to get drunk and come rob you. That's the world we're living in. And the fallen nature causes fallen men to you know the story. They put on bombs, go to a bus or a mall and they bomb everybody. That's the fallen nature. These things will always be there and they will trouble us. It causes thieves to come to your house, your peaceful home. They will break in and they will steal from you things that you have worked for in a long time. They will steal from you. If they find you dead, they will threaten your life. Those things might cause you to lose heart. Fallen people let us down, but we continue to trust them because we don't lose heart. But fallen people will always let us down. Fallen people hurt our feelings. Fallen people fail the Lord. They keep promising, but they never deliver. They fail. They're not that they fail you, they first fail the Lord. That is fallen people. And those things will cause you to lose heart. Fallen people hurt us physically. They hurt us emotionally and verbally and spiritually. They cause us to lose heart. So the only way for us not to lose heart is to cling to a risen Savior. Because man is fallen. You must cling to the risen Savior. The scripture says, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and they will not weary. They will walk and they will not faint. Those who wait upon the Lord, we are the ones who do not lose heart. Paul says we do not lose heart. It does not mean that Christians are immune to, dis to, to, to discouragement. We have already covered that. He says we are not immune to discouragement, but we do not lose heart. So when our faith is tested, let us remember, it is not the end of the world. The apostle is reminding us here that we don't lose heart. In other words, what does this mean? We don't give in. We do not allow ourselves to fall prey to discouragement. We don't live like defeated people. We look unto God. Secondly, what does it mean that our afflictions are light? And I think this is very important. He calls them light and momentary. They are light and momentary. Two things. They are light and momentary. The afflictions. And remember now, we're talking about the man who understands afflictions. He says they are light and they are momentary. In other words, they are there. There is no way to avoid them. They are serious. They can cause serious damage in a person, yet they are light, they are momentary. Two things. One, he says they are light. What does that mean? In other words, they carry no weight. They are serious. It's painful. It's hard. But afflictions carries no weight that will slow you down to run the race that is set before you. You can run with them. You can walk the Christian walk. You can live for Christ while you carry afflictions in your body. They are light. That is what he's talking about. They should not slow you down. They are light. And these afflictions, they come so that your faith is challenged and that your faith is shifted. Just as it was with Job. Job suffered so that he could lose focus on God. 
His faith was strong, but affliction come so that he lose focus on God, so that he begins to trust on the things that he achieved. This affliction came so that Job could think that God does not care, so that Job could think that God does not love him. God is not happy with him. God has forsaken him. God has forgotten him. The afflictions came, but Paul says they are light, and that might seem or feel like it's something like insensitive. It's a insensitive thing. Paul is not sensitive in what he's saying. He's called these things light. It's like they're insens insensitive. When you're going through them, it's not like that. Sometimes you feel the burden. They're not light. Their burdens are, they are heavy, almost unbearable. But Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us that from eternity's perspective, in the eyes of God, in the life that God has given you, in comparison to the life that God has deposited in you, these things are light. You have a faith that is stronger than your afflictions. You can run with them, as I was saying, from eternity perspective, not from the eyes of man. You must look at things from the eyes of God. They are light. And we're talking about a man who knows afflictions. Let me share with you the afflictions that he thinks they are light. Then you put yourself in the same scale as Paul's scale, so that you see that the afflictions are really light. Yours actually light. Second Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23 to 28. I'm gonna summarize. It tells us that Paul was whipped 39 times. You remember the 39 lashes that we spoke about last week that fell on Christ? Paul received the very same 39 lashes. Not once, not twice, not three times, five times. Tell me that is light. Paul was beaten with rods. Three times. Paul was stoned to death, preaching to people, stoning him for the fact that he wanted to change their lives, their destiny from hell to heaven. They stoned him. He was shipwrecked. Paul had drifted at sea for a night and a day, not knowing where he was going. Danger followed him. Danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from his own people. He had to fear his own kinsmen. He had to fear the, den the Gentiles. He had to fear not going to a city. He was in danger, facing danger even in the wilderness where he was. Danger from false brothers, people who pretended to be Christians, afflicted him. He had sleepless nights, could not sleep. You don't know what's going to happen at night. You don't know who's watching you, who's not watching you. He was hungry and thirst without food. This man was afflicted. He was cold at times and exposed to danger, exposed to death. And he had this pressure upon him, the anxiety, the pressure of the Christian churches that he will leave behind if he will die. He was afflicted. This was real and it's heartbreaking. How many of us can call this light? How many it says they are light these afflictions? In other words, you can have them and still carry on with the life of Christ. Jesus suffered more than that. We know we heard last week. And the Bible says, For the joy that was set before him, he enjoyed the cross and despised its shame. It's shame. Why? Because it was light and momentarily for him. It was light. Why do we say it was light? There's something better that you look forward to. The second thing says momentarily means temporal. Not only that they are light, but they are temporal. That's the second thing that he says. They seem at the time as if they are here to last. Trouble looks like it's going to last. This is something that I'm going through and it's going to last forever. Seem unending. We are in the midst of them. But he says, in the perspective of heaven and the heavenly glory that we are destined to in Christ Jesus, this is momentary. This is temporal. Friends, from the time of birth to the time of death, we are all afflicted and we are filled with afflictions and suffering. 
But if we are in Christ, what we get here, what we are encouraged here about is that if we are in Christ, the whole life of suffering which we live will prove to have been only temporal. That is what he's saying. Temporal compared to the life that we will have in him. The afflictions are real, according to the Apostle Paul. They are painful, but from God's perspective, these trials, this time of affliction that we undergo can only impact the outer body. That's why he's speaking of the body that is wasting away. They can only impact the outer body. They cannot touch your soul. No affliction can touch your soul. No affliction can change your destiny in Christ. So when life and people turn against you, it is easy to come to a place where you just want to quit. But Paul says these things are nothing. They are just like a vapor. They are temporal, momentarily. You don't have to be defeated by them. You don't have to be those kind of people who are known to have walked with God. You know, you know those people that used to walk with God. But the afflictions took him out of the walk with God. You don't have to be one of those people who used to go to church. The people who used to be part of the church in a great way, but they are no more. You don't have to be one of those people who used to be faithful, but affliction changed their heart for the worse. You don't have to be one of those people who loved their families, but affliction took that love away. These things are momentarily. Why? Because the third point, we have an eternal weight of glory. There's something better. What is the eternal weight of glory? We are told that the suffering that we suffer carries no weight, they are light and momentarily. Now we are told that it's something that carries weight. Something that carries weight. And Paul calls it eternal weight of glory in verse number 17. Paul is saying that hardship that we undergo in this world will give away to glory in the next life. It will give away to glory. This suffering leads to a way to glory. This present suffering alight and fleeting. They weigh less than a feather. You know a feather? That feather that comes from a small bird weighs nothing. It's not even a gram. So these things, they weigh less than that. If you look at it from heavenly perspective, they pass in a blink of an eye compared to the wonders that God has prepared for those who love him. Church, all believers will receive an eternal reward. That is all that is saying. All believers will receive an eternal reward. And the weight of glory is the new heavens and the new earth that is going to be revealed. That is why we need to take courage knowing that the difficulties that we experience right now are minor when compared to all that God has in store for his people. So this eternal weight of glory is the, res is the resurrection to a new life. That is our hope, the resurrection to a new life. This eternal weight of glory is to be with Christ forever, to have this everlasting joy that awaits us beyond the grave. So this passage is reminding us, church, that whatever happens, we must look ahead. We must put focus on the right place. You don't look on the passing things, but you look on the thing that is eternal. You look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of the faith. We keep checking our ambitions and our passions according to scripture. We wait for the Lord. He alone is the comforter of our souls. According to this passage, our bodies are not permanent. We must always be reminded. But what does that tell you about afflictions? If the body is not permanent and the afflictions affect the body, the afflictions are also not permanent. But it's something that is eternal. It is a spirit, the inner man that the scripture is talking about where we are. That is permanent. That is our joy with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is permanent. Our hope is then refreshed day by day. He says the inner person is refreshed, is made new. That's what it means. Our hope is refreshed day by day. As we look into the scriptures, as we consider the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
So although we are made of clay, although we are temporal particles, but our treasure is inside us. Look at verse number seven. Our treasures is inside us. Verse seven says, but we have this treasure in jar of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Treasure in these jars of clay. That is something that God has deposited within us that should keep us going. Our spiritual growth is our treasure. Our love for Christ is our treasure. Our unity with God in Christ Jesus is our treasure. And our hope for glory is our treasure. Look at verse number 17 one last time. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for internal weight of glory. That weight, preparing, that is the most important weight in that verse. Because we're not getting to the eternal weight of glory unless we are prepared. Something is preparing you to that eternal weight of glory. Something is preparing you day by day to remember that you should hope and trust in God, not in the things of this way. So Paul is looking forward to his future. He's looking forward to his future glory, his resurrection to, the, to, to, to life, the resurrection from the dead. He's looking forward to his union with Christ. He's saying all that is going through is preparing him. We need to make sure then that whatever we go through, personal or spiritual, is something that at the end of the day prepare us to eternal glory. You go through something, what is the situation, how do I respond? Because the way you respond prepares you for that eternal glory. The way you respond is either in a sinful way or in a glorious way. That's why it prepares you to eternal glory. The bottom line says that in this world, we will suffer in many ways. But we have hope. There will come a time where those who are happy right now outside Christ will not be happy. But those who are in Christ now who are suffering will be happy. And I can tell you, if the angels, as we read last week, as we heard last week, if the angels will come and, 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 and strengthen the Lord Jesus Christ during his afflictions, Jesus is better than the angels. He can, he can uplift, uplift us. He can strengthen us in our own afflictions. And the Bible agrees. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one in every respect has been tested, tempted, as we are yet without sin. We have a Christ who understands what we're going through. Church, in conclusion, in terms of trial and affliction, you can take heart. You can have courage. You can know that God is at work. You may not see it, but God is at work. You can rejoice. You can have confidence that though your outside man is afflicted, though your outside self is decaying according to the scripture and is wasting away through troubles of this life. They are picking up on you. Remember, nothing just happens. This present time of affliction has an eternal purpose, preparing you for that eternal weight of glory. Therefore, for all of your afflictions, Hold on to God in Christ Jesus. Feed on the word of God. It is the word of God that you need it the most. It is the word of God that lightens every burden that comes upon you. It is the word of God that will strengthen you so that you do not lose heart. One more thing. You need the fellowship of the saints. Speak to someone telling you it works. You need a fresh supply of the word of God every day. And the surprising thing is that it's the very same word that you know that someone else needs to speak to you so that you do not lose heart. Because someone else can say it better, someone else can say it at the right time. You need the word of God. The word of God is power. The word of God lighten the burdens, afflictions. The word of God reminds us that we do not lose heart. It reminds us that all afflictions are temporal, but Christ is eternal. The word of God reminds us that 
all these things are light and momentarily. They're just like a vapor. It reminds you that you have an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison that awaits you. It reminds you that the world will hurt you, but Christ will always love you. The good Lord bless us all as we think of this way. Let me draw some encouragement that you will need now or you will need in the future. Blessed be our God and amen. Let us pray to